I'm Bo. And I'm Jamie. And this is the only Ding Dong show where you're going to hear me ask the question, hey, Jamie, what you watching? <laughs> I think you're the only one who cares. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. And here's how I know it's not true. Um, because I wrote it down and I read it. No, I know it's not true <laughs> because you post all the time, or you or Brian one will post all the time, like, hey, here's the stuff that I'm watching. And like people comment like crazy on that stuff. Yeah, I gotta tell you, uh, I leave Brian in charge of that. Uh that way I don't have to do it. And um but he people really love he gets messages all the time from random people saying um hey man like i really love your reviews or hey man i watched this movie because you guys did and they'll give their opinion or whatever and you know sometimes we differ like a lot of times we'll have the same score but sometimes it'll be like vastly different like i made him watch jacko and um i love that movie it's terrible but i love it Mm -hmm. so and he was like half an inch away from giving it a poop emoji uh, so it's uh it's funny because when we differ then you'll have people coming in telling him that i'm right uh which is generally how it goes but <laughs> does, <yeah. laughs> does that ever go the opposite is somebody like look jamie is way off base uh, on this one it has but it, you know that's not significant the pr- <laughs> the- <laughs> i was gonna say the proper response is not if they know what's good for them they know. right <laughs> Now, if they're well, willing mean, to bring down the thunder. Brian always says, I'm the approachable one, you know, <laughs> so he's the grumpy one. So people tend to side with me. Yeah, I can see that. Like, I don't think Brian's grumpy, but I I, I think it's just because I share a similar vibe where it's yeah, just, and, you know, it's true. It's true. You know, it's just like he, he's a busy guy. He's got a lot on his mind and a lot on his plate. And mm-hmm. so he just doesn't have time for a lot of extraneous bullshit and that is exactly it it's uh um he leaves me to be the one to uh like converse with people if people make comments or whatever you know i'm generally the one that'll come or if people send messages regarding the show i'm gonna be the one typically that's gonna answer or you know talk to people and it's not because he doesn't want to it's just because he's you know like you said he's got a lot going on but now when you guys um well, when we did the Midnight Mass show, I it was hilarious to me because I was just like, wow. And I'm like that. But it there were so many similarities that I don't think necessarily anyone else would notice. But it's because I have like a long history of doing this with you. And then I have a history of doing this with Brian. And so I get it from like both sides. <laughs> and there is a lot that remind me of each other uh about a lot about you guys that remind me of each other yeah. but i think that that is actually that's a good thing because that explains why i enjoy spending time with the both of you so much yeah i mean i have a lot of admiration for brian he's a a, a very talented guy so i'll, he I'll puts take up that with me yeah well no yeah. i mean yes <laughs> yes i don't want to completely poo poo that idea but also that he's he, he just he's very he's very ambitious and he works hard and i admire those traits a lot so so do i i i really do and it it i'm very proud of him because he uh, accomplishes a lot and he's got he's got some really big projects like juicy exciting projects going on right now and he throws himself in yeah so um I'm juicy yeah juicy yeah. yeah um some really exciting stuff i'm excited about it but he like yeah he he puts the work in and um yeah i'm proud of him for that but that's what i always appreciated about you you know i loved that about you that when you know um when you spent a good chunk of time screenwriting you know you still would work all the time and then you would get i mean you used to get up at i don't know if you still do but you used to get up so early in the morning like <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. oh my and you would actually write before you went to work i'm like that's dedication uh, yeah i i still i still do that uh or but it's if it's not writing it's something else but i still i still try to write about a thousand words a day that's amazing yeah um but that's not the question i asked Jamie. oh no it's not it's not <laughs> 
Well, let me let me answer the question you, that you yeah. asked. Then I uh, pay attention for once. Mo- most uh, most recently at the theater, we saw Last Night in Soho. Oh, I have yet to see that. How did you How did you enjoy that one? I loved it. I loved it. I really did. the The music is incredible. Uh, I really love Matt Smith. Mm-hmm. He was amazing in it. Anya Taylor Joy is amazing in it. I didn't know that Diana Rigg was in it until I went to see it, and this was like her final role before she passed away. Um, she was really good, and Terrence Stamp was really good. Also, the lead Thomason uh, McKenzie. Uh, she was she's such a cute girl who like emotes really well she i believed everything she felt and it's just i didn't know a lot going about what it was going into it i knew that it was an edgar wright movie and i knew anya taylor joy was in it and that's pretty much all i knew i didn't dig into it really far and i had actually heard that it wasn't really a horror film. So I was like, well, but I wanted to see it because it looked cool from the trailer. And I like Edgar Wright and I like Anya Taylor-Joy. But then when I got there and I realized, oh my God, Matt Smith is in this and and Diana Rigg is in this and Terrence Stamp is in this. I mean, it was just, it was, I was kind of floored. Like visually, it's stunning. And the story is just a, it's a cool story, you know, and it takes place in London, which is cool. Um, there's actually a very funny moment where, uh, the girl, uh, she has moved into a house and she's talking to the landlady who is Diana Rigg. And she's like, has anyone ever died in this room? And she's like, honey, this is London. Someone has died in every room. Someone has died on every street corner. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's true because it's such an old city and a, a lot of its history is very dark. Um, and there's a whole lot going on in the underbelly there, but you get a uh, like some flashbacks to '60s, and then present day. Uh, I think it's blended beautifully. I, I just really, really enjoyed it, and his music choices were amazing. Of course, Edgar Wright is known for for good music choices, but um, I, I thought that he just nailed it. It. I cannot recommend it any more than I do. I love it. And also, I uh, actually do think it is a horror film. Um, It's very psychological. So it's not like an outright, uh, like a slasher, you know, or a a giallo, but it is very psychological. I mean, you actually are watching this character descend into madness. So if you like things like Black Swan, Mm -hmm. then I think you would appreciate this. So. All right, all right. I've yet to see it. I can't comment on that one yet, but uh, I'm I'm excited to do so. Uh, I saw. (laughs) See, sometimes they they suck me back in, Jamie. What happened was, (laughs) I was going through. I love it when stories begin with what happened was. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what happened was i was going through all, all the streaming services i subscribe to and there's about like 117 of them yeah and yeah. so i was trying Seems to legit. yeah well i was trying to get rid of it uh, or as many as i could of like what are what are the ones that i don't really watch that if i just spent three or four bucks renting a movie that i wanted to watch on amazon i could get rid of this whole streaming service that i'm paying eight bucks a month for and i don't give a shit about it and yeah, okay. so I got rid of a couple and one of the ones that I got rid of was the Disney plus. And then, <laughs> uh, they released jungle cruise and Shang-Chi and the legend of the 10 rings, neither of which I'd seen. And both of which I was at least mildly curious about on the same weekend. And I was like, ah, oh, God damn it. All right, fine. Disney plus you're here. Have your blood, have your, your silver, and uh so i ended up paying a couple of bucks and they had a like hey you canceled but welcome back and you can get it for two bucks so uh i did that and then immediately canceled again but i so i spent two dollars to watch both of those movies and the one that i want to talk about is jungle cruise at least initially uh because i thought shang chi was really good i thought that was a, a totally fun kung fu marvel movie um if you haven't seen it you ought to see it but Jungle Cruise answers the question of 
what if somebody walked into a room and told a bunch of writers, hey, you know how popular them Pirates of the Caribbean movies were? Mm -hmm. That, but Jungle Cruise. I And that's exactly when I first saw it advertised. That's the first thing I thought. It's exactly <laughs> shocking, Jamie. Yeah, like there is a point where I t I was I I was text texting my buddy Chad that I do the Pick Six show with. I was texting him and uh, I texted him. I was like, "So they just copy pasted that whole curse shit from Pirates into this movie, right?" And he was like, <laughs> "Oh, absolutely! Like it is just that again. Like nobody ever saw Pirates of the Caribbean." which was one of the most popular movies of the past, like, 20 years. And... And spawned a huge franchise. Right. Right. And it was like, you don't need the... Uh, I understand why they did it, because they were cynically making a movie. But and also, it's Disney. Yeah, and it it just bummed me out, because I, there were things about it I really like. Like, I, I like Emily, Emily Blunt, and I like uh, Dwayne Johnson quite a bit. And they're really entertaining and they're really charming. And the first, uh, like, 30, 45 minutes of the movie, I was like, you know, I'm really into this. I don't know why this movie got such a bum rap. And then it just turned into Pirates of the Caribbean down to the curses and, you know, just swap the moon with the river in terms of what the curse hinges on. Mm -hmm. And you're done. And it, that's the rest of the movie is trying to find a thing that'll lift the curse. Oh, right. See, I didn't think it was going to be that one to one. It, you know, a hundred percent is. <laughs> and it, like, Damn. and by, it right because when they were like, oh, there are these cursed uh, conquistadors <laughs> that can't be away from the river, and if they, uh, and the river will like drag them back if if they get out of sight of it. That's kind of the way the curse works. But as the movie went on and it just became more and more a ripoff of Pirates, I got more and more bummed out and kind of angry about it. Where it's like, you don't need this. Like, you've got a perfectly good villain with Jesse Plemons as this kind of weirdo archaeologist dude that is sort of like Belloc from Raiders of the Lost Ark, but I'll allow it because it's at least just an interesting character. And not a, a, a curse that you're copy pasting into this movie. It was really unfortunate. I, it really made me angry. So they did like a find replace with pirates and conquistadors. <laughs> that <laughs> and and then like one of the dudes, just like uh, in, in Pirates of the Caribbean, how like well when the moon is out. Uh, then they look all skeletal and gross. Right, right. They just had dudes that, w instead of the moon being the cause of it, they just kind of looked that way. But it was like dudes with like a face, but the back of their head was all a honeycomb and stuff like that. Like in that second Pirates movie, mm -hmm. where the, all the Davy Jones locker dudes were all kind of like, you know, half broken and barnacled and shit. And it was that kind of thing. It was like, well... You know, I guess I should give you credit for not ripping off one movie, but two. But <laughs> it was it was really unfortunate because, again, uh, Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt are having a good time in the movie. Also, listen to this shit. Um, there is a moment in the movie where Emily, th by the way, spoilers for Jungle Cruise, which is a movie you shouldn't watch. Um <laughs> <laughs> there's a emily blunt's character uh has a brother in the movie named mcdougall i think his name is and there's a point where uh the rock and mcdougall are on uh the shore and just kind of chit-chatting and the rock is like hey this emily blunt she's a real pistol huh is she always like that and the conversation turns to him Without saying the word gay, it's basically, oh, I'm a gay character in this movie. And he says, uh, you know, my family and, and all of society was going to disown me, but my sister stood by my side and I would walk into a volcano for her if I had to. And it was like, oh, that's kind of a nice moment. And, and at the end of the movie, 
it's going to be really nice when he has to make an act of sacrifice to save Emily Blunt or to do something heroic be- right. because he has to save her. Never happens. That's foreshadowing. Right. Oh, what? Never <laughs> happens. It's ju- it's just a scene, hand to God, so that when he says like, "Oh, I'm gay," except we're not using the word "gay" in this movie, for Rock to be like, "You know what? That's okay by me," and that's the whole scene. And I am all for representation and everything, but there is a stark difference between representation and pandering. Absolutely. And it, it's yeah. like when uh, Disney got real high and mighty about like, oh, there's a gay character in, a, in the new Avengers movie. And it turns out there was like one dude in a support group in one scene in the movie that was like, oh, by the way, my husband was c- killed when, you know, Thanos oh, snapped snap. his fingers. Yeah. And it's like, oh wait was that it was that the one you're talking about right (laughs) that you're patting yourself on the fucking back for and it's anyway jungle cruise really it continues to make me angry the more i think about it and i wanted to really like it because the front end of it was good well that's disappointing not that i was rushing out to see it but i assumed i would at some point and that, but the whole time I kept thinking, I just have a really nagging feeling this is going to be Pirates of the Caribbean. I just, <laughs> I, I, I felt that, you know, from the moment it was announced, uh, like I just, because they did it once, you know, and, and it worked really well. So let's not, you know, why not do it again? Yeah, it, it was really unfortunate. So what, what else have you been watching? Hopefully something much better than Jungle Cruise. <laughs> uh well it's not uh this is (laughs) this is an older movie Mm -hmm. uh by that i mean 40 years old and um i don't know if you ever watch cinema snob but uh that is one of the youtubers that we enjoy and he does this he's been doing this series where he'll do like all the movies released in 1980 uh-huh. All the movies released in 1981. And it's like a three hour show, but it's really entertaining. So we watched, we recently watched the 1981 show and he featured a film, a slasher that I had never seen. And I was like, oh, well, I'm always down to check out new slashers. I love slashers. And if I've never seen one, then I got to fill that gap. Right. So Brian, once I expressed that, I mean, and I just kind of offhandedly said, oh, I've never seen that. I should see if I can find it. Well, like the next day he found it and he's like, Hey, look, look what I got. I'm like, Oh my God, thank you. Well, I'm excited. So we, we were both excited and it's called scream. And I was particularly excited because, you know, there is a slightly more famous movie named scream. Mm, Not familiar, but go on. (laughs) And I was like, Oh, I can't believe I've never seen this or even run into it, but it's from 1981. And it's about this group of people that are going on a, um, like an outing to a ghost town, like out in the West. And I haven't seen anybody do that since like the Brady Bunch, you know, (laughs) but they're, they're going to like spend the night in this ghost town and it is so bad. I, I, I mean, by the time we got to the end of the movie, I was like, what the fuck just happened? You know, and I still am not a hundred percent sure, but uh, like one old guy wandered off and, and then he got killed off screen. Everybody got killed off screen. Like the, that's that, you know, there's nothing exciting about the special effects even here, oh, but no. he wandered off and he got killed off screen and then nothing happens for the longest time. Well, they find his body and then everyone decides, okay, well, we all need to stay together, but then they keep wandering off. And I'm like, what happened to staying together? But there are long stretches of no dialogue there. Everyone has mild surprise whenever they find a dead body, you know, no one seems, you know, convincingly upset about it. And I feel like it's one of those things where they were kind of making it up as they went along because there is, I mean, if there was a script for it, it's really bad. Then um, people just sort of, you know, they'll wander off and get killed and then wander off and get killed and wander. And, but it's, it's very repetitive. You don't see anything and it's it's very bad. And then randomly toward the end of the movie, this old guy shows up on a horse Uh and he's like, you know, Oh, uh, he starts, 
eventually, and, and I swear to God, there's about two solid minutes where they're all standing outside looking at him on his horse and he brought back one of the dead bodies and no one says a word. They just kind of stand and look at each other. I'm like, well, fucking somebody say something, you know? Well, then eventually he kind of tells him a story about how he used to uh, work on the, the ships like, and turns out that he's like a ghost and he worked on this ship way back. And what we can surmise is that the captain of that ship who got, um, I guess a, a corporation came and bought the and and bought the operation, and so they kicked him out on his ass and uh, like make forced him to retire. And so I think what we surmised from this is that whoever, like whomever is doing the killing, is this captain that's like angry. But it it what like why are you killing these random people in this ghost town that have nothing to do with shipping or any like there's it means nothing. It makes no sense. Then that guy goes away. Uh -huh. And then later on, he comes back at like a, uh, I don't know, sailor ex machina and <laughs> shoots the ghost. And then Whoa. they're all just standing around looking at each other. <laughs> they shot yeah. the ghost? He shot the ghost. And well, we think because we never see it. We don't. It's off screen. Like you see the guy and you see him shoot, but you don't see what he shoots at. You don't see anything. And then uh, this random old couple pulls up in a pickup truck and then they all just stand around looking at each other. And that's, and then the movie ends. And I was like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> like, I have no idea. And I'm dead serious. There will be several minutes, stretches of minutes with no dialogue whatsoever. They're all just sitting around looking at each other. And <laughs> like, I have no idea what's, I was so angry that I actually took the time to find this movie. Now, in Brad's defense, when mm -hmm. he did the show, he didn't say it was good. He did not recommend that you go watch it. He was simply just naming a movie that came out in 1981. But I was like, oh, I, I need to see this movie. No, I didn't. No one needs to see this movie. It, it, you don't. Like, no one ever. Do not seek this movie out, please. Like, it seriously is not worth your time. And I was so upset. I was just, I wanted it to be something good. I wanted it to be something, you know, like a hidden gem that I'd never heard of and it was going to blow my mind. I was going to be all excited and be able to tell people about it. No, it's awful. <laughs> I mean, just bad. So, so that was unfortunate. You're saying to check out Scream from 1981. That's what I'm taking away from this. Uh, yeah, do that as a double feature with Jungle Cruise. <laughs> and, then, and then just give up on everything. That's how that works. <laughs> just stop living. Yeah. Uh, oh, right, that sounds terrible. <laughs> it was. It's awful. It's really, really bad. Really, really bad. I don't know the last time I saw a movie that bad. All right. Well, so let me talk about briefly a movie that I know I have talked about already recently, but I don't give a shit because <laughs> I'm a rebel, Jamie. I know. I uh, You beat your own drum. Wait, walk to the beat. How does that go? I don't know. Whatever you it is, you beat do your it. own meat. <laughs> well, you probably do that, too. I do. I, I'm not calling you out. I don't judge. Yeah. I'm, well, look, <laughs> I'm just I'm a healthy man with urges. And uh, and sometimes too much time on my hands, um, <laughs> and a, and a phone that has access to a world of pornography, Jamie. That's, that is true. That's the other ingredient in that recipe <laughs> is just all the porn you could imagine. Um, that's not what I wanted to talk about, though. I want to talk. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the movie Spontaneous which we did recently on the, the Heart of Horror show on Dark Parade, but um, I love this movie. And the reason I'm bringing it up is just to get you to either see it or talk about it, because you would love that movie. Even, I have not seen it. Okay, do you, know what, do you know the premise of Spontaneous? Do you know the movie no. I'm talking about? Okay, so the basic idea behind Spontaneous is there is a... Uh, a young woman who is about to graduate uh, from high school when all of a sudden uh, people in her class, in her senior class, start spontaneously exploding. Mm -hmm. 
Ooh, I was about to, damn it. And I was going to joke and say, is it spontaneous combustion? Because I'd be all over that. It's not spontaneous <laughs> combustion. They just explode into a bloody goo. Well, I, I, I can still get behind that. Yeah, right. And so that's the hook of the movie. But it is a very thinly veiled metaphor for growing up in an era where school shootings are a thing. Oh, okay. And also, it is one of the sweetest love stories I have ever seen put to screen about, like, that sort of young love where you just meet that one person where you're like, oh, fuck, they get me. And it's very funny. It's very sweet. Um, it's, it's definitely got an edge to it. And I, a lot of people uh, who I've recommended this movie to are like, yeah, this seems very teeny bopper. And it's like, eh, just watch it. It's not, it, it's it's got more teeth than that. It is not just a feel-good John Hughes movie. There There is some shit that happens in the movie that'll break your fucking heart. And uh, uh-huh. it's it's great. It was one of my favorite movies of last year. We just rewatched it again for Heart of Horror, and I got Court and Kate to watch it, and they both loved it as well. And I, I'm just out here once more evangelizing about this movie. Like uh, the the lead actress is a uh, a young woman named Catherine Langford, um, who was you would know her as the rich daughter from Knives Out. Oh, okay. You know, the the movie. one that's like, it seems kind of cool, but turns out to be just as shitty as everybody else in the family. Her. Right. Except she's the lead in this. She is so good um, and very funny. <laughs> the, the movie, uh, slight spoilers, the movie ends with her giving this big speech about what life means, essentially, and how to live your life in a way when there is a, an ever present threat of death both yourself and people you love and all of that and uh there's a great moment where she says you know what you just have to say suck my dick life and go out and live the best way that you can and it's something that i've got printed on a number of t-shirts at this point <laughs> I, and bumper stickers i get pulled over all the time now but it's uh it's a terrific movie and I'm I'm just telling more people you need to watch Spontaneous. It is Well, I just put it in my notes. So Great. I it is if you have Hulu, do. It is free on Hulu. Nice. Okay. And it is a terrific film. So, uh that that is just me, like I said, just banging the drum once more to get more people to watch this movie until finally it is the most popular movie in the world and they make a sequel called uh planned maybe i was no oh, that was gonna be my joke <laughs> <laughs> gotcha <laughs> okay well i will definitely check it out all right all right Hit because me. kate likes it yeah uh, yeah yeah not because <laughs> no, yeah don't take my word for it i'm the one that will tell you to watch that 1981 scream um, <laughs> no you wouldn't you wouldn't I, I might <laughs> i'm a little stinker sometimes <laughs> uh okay <laughs> have you seen squid game yet i have not oh man, i know we, we uh ran through that in two days and it's one of those shows i mean it's basically and i know you've heard it's that's what everyone's saying it's basically like battle royale um mm-hmm. and you know it it is and but the characters i love them you know, particularly, uh, there's this one character, he's an old guy, like a really old guy. And I, I just adore him. And I told Brian, like we started watching it. I'm like, something's going to happen to that old man and it's going to wreck me. Yeah. Um, uh, but I loved him. The lead character at first, you're kind of, you think that he's like a piece of shit because he lives at home with his mom. He does work, but he gambles all his money away. You know, he drinks all the time. He gets into fights. You know, he's basically, he's our age, but he's not, um, at, yeah, I want to say he's 47, but he's not at all like a responsible man, you know, and he has a little girl who lives with her mom 
and he is constantly disappointing her. And it's just like, uh, like at first you're just like, oh, this guy, but he is such, uh, he has such a good heart and he's one of those people that he's not a bad person, but he just keeps making shitty decisions and he just keeps fucking up his life. But like, he once you get to know him you see that he's such a good person and it just makes you pull for him that much and and the idea for anyone who doesn't know the idea is that there's a a giant rich we don't know who they are no one knows who they are and they invite people to come into the to play this game and then it you win a bunch of money you know and whoever survives at the end doesn't have to be one person however many people are surviving at the end they split all the money um there was a nice little cameo um he popped up twice i can't remember his name but the lead from uh train to busan oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay i love him but he plays a very small role and he just basically pops into cameo but uh it was exciting to see him because i don't really know a lot of Korean actors, <laughs> you know, it's not like I'm going to see anybody in this cast and just be like, Oh, I love them. You know, but then he popped up and I knew him and I'm like, yay. <laughs> but uh, it's really fun. It's dark. It's very dark, but you know, that's, that's what we like. And, uh, it, but it's also very funny. It's very heartwarming. It's uh, it really gets you emotionally invested. And I am just in love with the soundtrack. Uh, I actually found it was so funny. I was playing the soundtrack at work the other day and I'm just, you know, going about my business and I've got it on the low, you know, cause I'm allowed to keep my, I'm allowed to play my music for until 10 AM. If I keep it at a low volume, um, <laughs> <laughs> fixing so, some glitches. I get it. <laughs> so I, you know, just had it on in the background while I was doing my stuff. And I started like, all of a sudden I, I I had probably the closest thing to a panic attack I've ever had. Like I, I couldn't sit still. My body, my, my stomach was all knotted up. Like, like if you like just have a whole lot of anxiety, you know, like you're just, you feel like, I don't know. I, I, I was like, what the hell? Like I had to get up and walk around the office. I'm like, what is going on with me? And like, I was shaking. <laughs> it was so weird. And then I, uh, switched my music to something calming. And this was also on the cusp of me having to take my, uh, my state exam. So I was already kind of had a lot of anxiety about that because it's a really hard test. And, you know, I was kind of worried about that. So it just sort of just, just amplified everything that I was feeling. Well, then I switched my music to something calming and immediately everything just went away. And then it hit me, son of a bitch. It was the score <laughs> to Squid Game that had me so anxious. Oh. And I was like, look at those bastards. Look what they did. Uh, you know, so, I mean, and you know, a lot of times when people are doing soundtracks, they will purposely inject things that, you know, make you feel however they want you to feel. And I realized that, yeah, that's exactly what it was that soundtrack was freaking me out. Like not even without totally subliminally, like I wasn't even realizing it, but it had me so on edge that uh, I I thought I was going to snap. It was, and I was like, well, I guess I shouldn't do that. <laughs> At least not, you know, continuously. You know, if I, I what you mean go it, crazy. Like, yeah. Well, I probably shouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I no, I mean like maybe I shouldn't listen to that soundtrack in large chunks anymore. Like listen to the whole thing. Cause it is, it was just cycling through and I just kept listening to it. And I'm like, okay, so short controlled bursts of that soundtrack from now on, because it's really good at what it does. And I had no idea. It kind of snuck up on me, but I just thought that was really interesting. Uh, the last soundtrack that did that to me was Antrim. And I don't know if you ever saw that movie. I I don't think we ever talked about it. Yeah. I saw, I saw Antrim. I thought it's almost a better idea than it is a movie, but it wasn't bad. Like I just, yeah. I, I kind of want it to be a little bit m- lean into the horror of it a little more. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's okay. Antrim is, yeah, a, is totally okay. I don't think you're wrong in that at all. But there were several things from it that I took away that I really enjoyed. 
like the vintage film look. I thought that they did that really well. Whereas a lot of times people kind of overdo it. I, I think this was just like the color coding or color coding, the color grading was just right. Um, I, I think they really did a good job of paying attention to stuff like that. But it was mainly the score of that film that I fell in love with. And I actually had read where when they were composing that score, they very purposely injected tones that are supposed to affect you on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are times, and I'll still listen to that soundtrack, but there are times when I can, I hear, like, I just feel chills go over me or it really affects me. And that's the last time that I had something like that affect me until the Squid Game score, which is, it's kind of quirky, um, and it changes up like there are different songs for different things that are going on, but it's really well constructed, really good. Anyway, if anyone has not seen that show yet, it's on Netflix. And I know it was like everyone was talking about it a few weeks ago or a little while back and like everyone and their brother had seen it. But so chances are probably good that people have seen it. But if you haven't, I highly recommend it. I enjoyed the hell out of it. And uh, you can watch it with subtitles. Or that you can watch the dubbed version, which unfortunately I kind of have to do these days if there's one available, just because I am so blind. It's oh, very difficult. No. Yeah, it's very difficult for me to read subtitles these days. And as the, the older I get, the worse it gets. And it depresses me because I actually like subtitles, but um, we had to opt for the dubbed version. Because what'll happen is like by the time my eyes focus on what's on the screen, it changes and then i end up missing what's going on on the screen because i spend all my time trying to read um i really just need to go to the eye doctor is what i need to do yeah i was but... i was gonna <laughs> let you i didn't know if you'd heard about this but there are actual actual lenses you can get that will what uh, yeah alter your that sight to improve you. it. i mean i've only had them for uh, what 30 years yeah, I actually have reading glasses, and my eye doctor told me that the next time I came in, I was going to have to get bifocals. Yeah, yeah. They, and, oh, but they don't call them bifocals anymore. They call them transition lenses to and, make you uh, feel better about it, but yeah, they're bifocals. So you don't feel like your grandma. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so until I do that, then we're doing dubbed when we can just for my just for the ease of – and honestly, it, it, it wasn't terrible. You know, sometimes dubbed films can be – really really bad and it it wasn't it, it was fine uh so yeah i do recommend watching that show it was a lot of fun yeah i it, i will absolutely get to it um i just haven't had the time like i'm you know it turns out like you and i are doing a show with uh duncan in the not too distant future where we're doing the a24 movies and then i'm doing another thing with him and uh doug tilly that is watching all the william friedkin movies and so when I'm, it, it's one of those things where if I'm not doing one of those things, I feel a little guilty about what I'm watching. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't like, <laughs> sometimes I'll slip one in early so that later in the evening, like tonight, I'll be able to sit down and kind of watch a movie and watch whatever I want. Cause I've, I've already done my Friedkin bit for the day. Um, but, but let me know. Jamie, let me tell you about a movie I saw that has nothing to do with either of those things. Okay. I saw The Deep House. Which... Oh my God. I was just listening to Exploding Heads on the way home today and Brandon and Dave brought that movie up. Okay. So this is the one by, uh, hold on. Let me get the director's names because I'll, I'll screw it up if I don't. It is uh, and Alexander Bustillo and Julian Murray. Are Julian Mori, um, the guys who did Inside? Yeah, yeah. And so it is. <laughs> it's a really basic premise, which is just, hey, what if there was a haunted house underwater and you had to dive into it? And that's the whole movie, yeah. Uh, in in a nutshell, but it has some very creepy visuals. And I don't think it's a, a like a mind blowingly good movie, but I think it's really interesting and it's it's creepy enough that I watched it a couple of times after I rented it, 
and uh I, yeah i dug it though it's it's eerie and it's got like a wisp of lovecraft but not it doesn't go hard in that direction but it's got a little a little whiff a little sousant of hp lovecraft and um yeah there's something i i what i learned about myself in the watching of the deep house is seeing dead bodies chained up underwater is a thing that creeps me out well i can't imagine why i know i know uh because <laughs> when i was a kid in the tub i would chain my bath time toys in the water all the time and that was just good fun but seeing actual people's and not you know bury the rubber duck story yeah yeah well you know about my bath time as we've talked about that when i used to have to get out of the tub i would play jaws and then i would scare myself and i'd have to get out of the tub (laughs) that's that goes back to devour but uh, yeah i I even now that you say it yeah i had this one cheap knock off Barbie doll the kind you get at like the dollar store where it's hollow plastic and her torso had come apart from her legs and she was missing an arm and she had long blonde hair but it was all matted and I used to pretend her her name was Chrissy uh-huh. and <laughs> so I would have her like and that had the Jaws game with the plastic shark and uh, so that would go in the tub and then they would, my other Barbies would find Chrissy on the beach, which would just be the side of the tub. And then, you know, I just, I, I was like a twisted child. I was you like would, six. You, you would have the doll like on the side of the tub going, Pippin, Pippin. <laughs> no, I couldn't play that part because it always made me cry. <laughs> oh no. That upset me too much. But anyway, then I would start freaking myself out because it's sharks. And then I would have to climb out of the tub and I would stand on the side of the tub and peer down into the water. I mean, we're talking bath water. It's like six inches deep, yeah. <laughs> but I would like to look down into the water to make sure there were no sharks coming after me. But what are you going to do? Anyway. <laughs> anyway, deep house. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm mostly wrapped up with, with deep house. I, I thought it was good. You know, it's not a great movie, but it's it's a pretty good, you know, turn out the lights. It's It's got the right kind of claustrophobia. There's the added element of like, oh, we're about to run out of air if we keep... And, and, and like, once they get into this house underwater, and it's a reasonable enough reason for this house to be completely submerged. But once they get inside the house, the way that they got in is suddenly bricked up and they can't get out and they're running out of air. And also ghosts are chasing them. And that ain't uh, good. Sounds good to me. It's I, good, yeah. now on my homework list. Uh, I have a list running, so. Uh, yeah, but I, all right, so that that's Deep House out of me. What about you, Jamie? Okay, uh, so uh, Elijah Wood just uh, did a ted bundy movie called no man of god Uh uh-huh and that it basically is elijah wood is playing an fbi agent who got really close to ted bundy before his trial and they sent him in because ted bundy seemed to like him and they were trying to you know use him to get information because really up until the very end you know um they were trying to do the Henry Lee Lucas thing where they, you know, trying to get him to tell him, you know, where the bodies were, how many people he killed, you know, just because so that that way they could give a little closure to the families. Um, and I don't he didn't really do the Henry Lee Lucas thing where Henry, according to Henry Lee Lucas, he was responsible for everything all the way back to Lincoln's assassination. But <laughs> the, uh, yeah. the the majority of this film is just the two of them having a conversation. Here's the thing, though. It's really the the performances are really good. I can't remember the guy's name who plays Ted Bundy, but he is like on the nose. He's he he looks like him and he does an excellent job with the role. Elijah Wood is Elijah Wood. He's always good. You know, I just I, I love him. And he he just always has this really sensitive, endearing quality to him. Um, well, except for in like Sin City, right? Even then, I felt bad for him. You know? or, or maniac when he's you know a right. maniac. 
but I felt bad for him in Maniac. Like I wanted him. That that was the beauty of that film, is that I wanted good things for him. I wanted him to be happy and stop killing. I wanted him to fall in love and then everything to go okay. Because the way Elijah would portray that character, even though you didn't see him the majority of the time, because it was from his POV, I he just was able to do that. So that's just how how good he is at least like how he affects me that way i just i love his acting so he did a great job in this film uh, the performances are amazing it's just not necessary in that you don't they don't really you don't learn anything you didn't already know you know there have been so many ted bundy movies out there mm-hmm. and if you are a serial killer I don't want to say fanatic because that's the wrong word, but if you are uh, interested in serial killers at all, then <laughs> an you already enthusiast. know. An enthusiast. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm talking about me here, so I'm trying to use a, a, a good word. <laughs> um, I have always found them fascinating. You know, so I dig into serial killers. I'm actually looking, I'm in my library right now and I'm looking at my serial killer shelf and there's just all kinds. My roommate used to laugh at me all the time because she's she would see my bookshelf and she's like, if anybody ever comes in here, you're going to be on a list. And I'm like, why? And she's like, look at this. Serial killers A to Z, killers through time, depraved, women who kill, crime scene investigations, the crime encyclopedia. And then she would always t- get tickled because Fester's baby book would be on the same shelf. And it's like, my wonderful cat. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, if you are uh, up on your serial killer history, particularly one who is as notorious as Ted Bundy, you're really not going to take anything away from this film. They didn't really shed any light on anything that really makes it worth the time it takes to watch it. And that's unfortunate because like I said, the performances are really good, but if you already know about Ted Bundy, then there's really no need. And then if you don't know about Ted Bundy, this really doesn't delve deep enough to tell you anything I mean, there are better movies out there as far as them being more comprehensive. So it really just is kind of useless. And that's sad. Like, I I wanted it to be something really good because Elijah would. And it just, even though the performances were there, there's just no need to watch it. So that's unfortunate. Yeah, that's a bummer. I, I almost pulled the trigger on that one a couple of times and just never quite did um and i i at some point i'm sure i'll still see it because yeah i mean the ingredients are all there like you and i are of the same cloth where it's like oh a book about how to get away with murder i'm down yeah yeah and so if you are a completist when it comes to stuff like that you know and there this is a, a gaping hole if you're a big elijah wood fan it's worth it but you know if you're going in looking for something about ted bundy that you just didn't know this isn't gonna scratch that itch yeah i (laughs) i I go back and forth with like it on the one hand you know i agree with you like there was something about the idea of like aberrant psychology and just how dark and extreme the human brain can get where Mm -hmm. you know i i think for you and i we are people for whom the idea of taking another life is so crazy that you're just sort of fascinated with people who seem to do it as a compulsion, you know, yeah, like they I can't just not do it. Who are like compelled, you know, it, that is, it's, that's what's fascinating about it is because it's so outside the norm. Yeah. And, and, but that's, I, I find it really, really interesting, but I also find it, you know, horrifying and it's mm-hmm. it's that great combination of I'm really interested in this and also it kind of scares me because there is nothing quite as frightening as somebody who kills you for no good reason other than it's what gets them all for that they can't not do it. And when you learn like, oh, it turns out serial killers have all these things in common, like, you know, childhood head injuries and uh, being raised a certain way and, you know, abuse and trauma and that kind of thing. And you start to realize like, oh, that's a thing that can just happen to people that Mm -hmm. there's definitely a little bit of nature, but there's plenty of nurture 
to it as well that makes somebody just you know flip their lid and go cuckoo bananas i think is the yeah. medical term for it that yeah it's straight out of the straight out of the books yeah, like, it's... <laughs> i have uh like, talking about the scary side of it i have a book it's an excellent book called um i think it's by the grace of god or there by the grace of God, go I. I don't think it's the full thing. I think it's just by the grace of God. But it is all retelling or, you know, accounts of people who narrowly escaped serial killers and didn't know it. You know, like they had no idea that they were about to be the next victim. And uh, that is, when I read that, it that was truly terrifying because the thing about serial killers is is it's not like you can say well i'll just avoid them you know that you don't know who they are you know and they don't have to know you you know it'll be a total stranger and that's usually what it is you know it's a complete stranger that just comes up to you or you somehow end up being you know tied into them in some way and you have no way of knowing, you have no way of seeing it coming. You can't, uh, of you know, just, I mean, there are things that we can do as humans to avoid most dangerous situations uh, just by being alert or being aware. But when it's something like that, it doesn't always work that way. And especially, I mean, they tend to prey on people who are sensitive to others so like you know like one of the things that he would always do with the cast you know or and they even exploited that in uh silence of the lambs you know you see somebody struggling who is injured or who has a disability of some kind and you the human side of you wants to help them but that is what can get you killed and yeah. that to me is not only horrifying but it's heartbreaking because it leads us as a species to be less likely to help each other and for good reason, but it's sad. It's so sad. And that, you know, there, that among many other things, I, I just find it incredibly fascinating, the dark side of human nature. And especially like being preyed upon for the natural instinct to be kind yeah. is that's also, I think, quite terrifying. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you're the kind of guy that, that uh, just like I am, I mean, I'm not that I'm not that kind of guy, but we're, we're the, we're two people, I think, who, if we see a fellow human being in, in distress, we would want to try to alleviate that stress. If you can, yeah, you know, yeah. you would, you would want to try to help them, but there is a side of you that it, you know, just starts knocking on the back of your brain saying, uh, you know, <laughs> this could be a very dangerous situation and that's it's sad that we have to be that way but you know you know it's i don't know uh but yeah i mean that's dark shit and it's dark true shit like that's the part that really i mean of all the horror movies that we watch and we watch a lot you know yeah. there is still something that is never as terrifying as what the, the is what a human is capable of in real life. What is because uh, we're we're closing in on the end of the episode, which is crazy. But I feel like we talked about two movies. I, I, know, I know we did. I know we didn't. But yeah, we we covered a little bit of grub. But let me ask you this: so outside of Silence of the Lambs, because that's the you know the pinnacle of serial killer movies. Mm -hmm. um what is the best serial killer movie is it is it henry henry portrait of a serial killer I, that's that was the fir it's the first thing that pops into my head um and i think part of that is rooker's performance in that is is so good um actually all the performances in that are uh tom tolls and and kim grice they're all really good um or is that kim grice uh keep going and i'll i'll fact check you but uh the performance in that are, re are are really really good and but i was actually thinking about that movie the other night because we were watching uh the new dexter and i was thinking about how you know m a lot of times well, the majority of the time with serial killers oh no we were watching some show a new show on netflix that talks about serial killers because um 
if there's going to be a show out there, I'm going to watch it. But, mm-hmm. um, but, and they were talking about how, um, you know, serial killers will typically have their signature, you know, they'll have the, the way that they do things, you know, you can, um, they'll, they'll, they always like to use cords around the house to tie their victims up. They'll kill them the same way. They'll take the same body part as a trophy or whatever. But the thing that I always found most horrifying about Henry is when he was talking to Otis about how to kill people and get away with it. And he explained to him, he's like, I do it different every time. He's like, sometimes I'll shoot people. Sometimes I'll strangle people. Sometimes I'll stab people. And then it makes you think how many people are out there doing that sort of thing. And they'll never get caught because no one's ever going to put those murders together. And I just think that's just terrifying. And then that film is so gritty and so dark. And then the end of it is just heartbreaking. Um, I really do. Uh, I really do have an affinity for that film, even though the whole time I'm watching it, I'll be clenched up. <laughs> like I'll notice when the movie's over that I'm just, my whole body is clenched because it's just that unnerving. But yeah, I would say that's probably my favorite. Yeah. So a little uh, correction. It is Tracy Arnold. Okay. Okay. She uh, reminds me of her. That's why I, uh, Oh, and then Kim Grice is in Manhunter. That's right. That's why. That's why. Okay. And yeah. And there, there's some similarities to be sure, but yeah, you're right. Like Henry portrait of a serial killer is, I, I haven't seen it in years and years because it just gets under your skin. I mean, it's such yeah. a, it's such a difficult movie to watch because it is so well done. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, it's disturbing. It's not a fun, you know, uh, let me just throw this on and watch it for kicks. You know, I, I can't do that with that film. Right. I'm having people over. I want something to throw <laughs> right. on in the background. So, yeah, yeah something <laughs> something we can just drop in and out of. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's just, like, it's heart-wrenching because... It you know that there as you said there are people out there that this movie captures like that psychology and yeah I do wonder like in in this day and age of increased technology is it harder to be a serial killer? I think it is because of DNA that when DNA came along or the ability to test DNA that was such a breakthrough and. It, I mean, now retroactively, we're still going back and finding people who were guilty of things or finding that people are innocent of things they've been convicted for because of DNA technology. And I, I do think, yeah, in this day and age, you've got to be, I mean, don't, uh, <laughs> don't be more careful because if you're a serial killer, I, I want you to get caught. But uh, if you're going to do something like that, I think any kind of crime these days is much more difficult to do because also we have, uh, I was just watching uh, Dateline this past Friday and this woman <sighs> um, was so, she she like planned the murder of all, like five different people died in and related to this family and everything is laid out in emails and text messages and if it's not in a message, they can ping where the phone was at the time. You know, it, it's, you just, there's so many different ways now that they can nail down exactly what you did, when you did it, where you were, you know, um, it's really difficult comparatively, you know, yeah. when Henry Lee Lucas, I mean, of course, um, Henry is, is loosely based on Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Tool. When they were active, Things were so different and it was so much easier to just get away and then leave the state. I mean, he was all over the place, you know, so he would do something and then leave the state. They're never going to find him, you know, but um, you just go back 30 years to Eileen Warnos and it was much easier to find her, not just because uh, that actually didn't have anything to do with DNA, but she was using the same gun all over the place. So they had, you know, um, they were able to track that down 
it's just every little bit get, I mean, everything gets easier and easier as time goes on and technology grows. Now, of course, there are still people that get away with things. There are still people will, there are still things we'll never know the answer to like Jack the Ripper, but um, there are some pretty solid theories out there, but I don't think we'll ever definitively know the answer to that. So yeah. Um, and, but that's good. I, I, that's all good things. You know, I, I'm glad that, that the unfortunate thing is when, um, when um, people like there have been cases of people being wrongly convicted and even then when they should be exonerated, when they find out that they definitively did not do it, uh, if it's something that the city has made a mistake doing, they're not going to admit it. And they will do anything to keep from having to admit that they were wrong, including ruining that person's life forever by keeping them in jail for something they they know damn well they didn't do so i don't know all right uh, well all right well that's on that note on true crime yeah <laughs> and on that note that is gonna